us? We'll do some Bible study. So, uh, this last Sunday was the fifth Sunday after Trinity, and we got to hear the, the calling of the first... Is that right? Fifth Sunday? Yeah. The calling of the, the first apostles. Uh, we had uh, the calling of Peter, James, and John, the miraculous catch of fish. Um, and one thing that I noted in my sermon in a couple ways was Jesus' uh, forgiving of Peter. Uh, when Peter realized uh, who Jesus was, he pulled an Isaiah, and he, he was kind of, you know, get, left, get out of here, Lord, because I'm a sinner. And Jesus, instead of uh, destroying him, of course, forgave him. So we'll hear that mentioned here in his prayer. So let us pray. O Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who have given us your precious word and blessed us with every physical blessing, we acknowledge that we are unworthy of all these things and have certainly deserved much worse. And we beseech you to forgive us our sins as you did Peter's and bestow success and health to our calling, that we, being supported and defended by you both now and forever, may praise and glorify you for eternity. In your own name we pray. Amen. All right. So last week, we started with the Small Called Articles. Uh, and Small Called is a place in Germany uh, where there was this alliance uh, between a, a number of, of governors and dukes, uh, that it was a political alliance for the purpose of self-defense. Uh, see, at this time, the, the Pope had an army, uh, and also the Pope had the Emperor kind of uh, in his deck, in his hand. You know, the Emperor was the Emperor, but he did what the Pope told him, for the most part. And the Emperor had an army, a very dangerous army. And uh, as territories became Lutheran and the, the Pope lost money and land, the solution to that uh, in the Pope's mind was to use force. Uh, that in order to uh, retain land and money, uh, the Pope or the Emperor uh, would use deadly force uh, to, to kill Lutherans, to restrain people, to, to terrorize people, to keep them from becoming Lutherans. Uh, and the purpose of this alliance at Small Call was to be a deterrent. You know, that if the, the Pope or the Emperor uh, would like to come and attack this region in Germany, uh, if they did that, there was an alliance of other princes who would come to aid. And it was meant to be a deterrent. Uh, and to be part of this alliance, you had to... Uh, sign your name to the Augsburg Confession. This was a political alliance, but the way that you joined the alliance was by a confession of faith. Uh, that's what united them. Uh, and in time, the prospect finally came then for a council. And back when we did the Augsburg Confession, we talked about this. Uh, does anybody remember what a council is in this context? A council is a gathering of bishops from the whole church uh, to, to gather and consider an issue. Uh, so one that we should know, uh, which all Christians claim, there's, there's been several of these councils over history, uh, which all Christians acknowledge is the council at Nicaea, which is in 325. And the purpose of that council was to denounce, to respond to, and to denounce Arius. Arius was a pastor who taught that the Son of God is a creature, that he is not God in the same way that God the Father is God, that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist. And it got so bad that the church had to call a council, which was a gathering of all the bishops from all over, and they considered scripture and said, no, that's, Arius is not right. We condemn this teaching, right? Uh, we say that every time, uh, well, what creeds do we say in church? We have the Apostles' Creed. 
Nicaea. Yeah, and the Nicene Creed, guess where that comes from? Nicaea. The Council at Nicaea. That's where that comes from. That's the point of that creed. Um, so there's been several councils over, over history, and when the Augsburg Confession happened, the emperor said, you know what? We really should have a council. And he actually promised that to the Lutherans, said, you know, we, we should have a council. Um, now, at Nicaea, it wasn't the Pope who called this gathering. It was the Emperor, Emperor Constantine. He called this gathering of theologians. Uh, but by the time of Luther, the Pope had taken that over and said, only the Pope can call a council. And so the Pope said, all right, we'll call a council later. And then that Pope died, and then another Pope came and said, yeah, we'll, we'll have a council later. You know, and then another Pope came and said, you know what, we're going to have a council, and you know what we're going to do at this council? We're going to condemn those rotten Lutherans. You know, it's not going to be a free council. The Lutherans are not going to get a fair hearing. The point of this council is to get rid of those Lutherans. Uh, and so in response, this document that we're reading, the Small Club Articles, is meant to be Luther's writing to be delivered at a council, which he suspects isn't actually going to happen. You know, and we left off last week in his, his little preface where he was talking about this, where he's saying, you know, I, I hope that a council happens, but I, I really don't think it is going to happen. And we left off, I think at verse, paragraph 10, excuse me, uh, does everybody have a Book of Concord back there? I, otherwise, I have a handout up here. It should be about page 261 or so. Um, my little edition up here is, is the page numbers are a little bit different. But we are in the, the preface to the small called articles, and then we'll get into the actual articles uh, very shortly. This is paragraph 10. It says, and so I return to the subject. I really would like to see a truly Christian council so that many people and issues might be helped. Not that we need help. Our churches are now, through God's grace, enlightened and equipped with pure word and right use of the sacraments, with knowledge of the various callings and right works. So on our part, we ask for no counsel. On such points, we have nothing better to hope or expect from a council. But we see throughout the bishops' jurisdictions so many parishes vacant and desolate that it breaks our heart. Still, neither the bishops nor the church officials care how the poor people live or die. Christ has died for them, and yet they are not allowed to hear him speak as the true shepherd with his sheep. This makes me shudder and fear that Someday he might send a council of angels upon Germany who will utterly destroy us like Sodom and Gomorrah for wickedly mocking him with the pretext of council. Now, something has shifted in Luther's thought here uh, because this is after the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession was about six years before this, and although Luther wasn't there at Augsburg because, uh, well, the Pope was looking for him, he adopted the Augsburg Confession as this is his teaching. You know, and, and when he references elsewhere a confession he has already made, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the Augsburg Confession. And at that time, the Lutheran position was kind of, we should have a council so that everybody can see that we're not wrong. You know, that we're not scoundrels, we're, we're not making this up, we're not teaching a new teaching, we're teaching what the Bible and what the church has always taught. But here, Luther's thought has shifted. Because we see here where he says that the point of having a council is not to justify the Lutherans, but who does he hope would benefit from a council? Everybody else. He says there are vacant churches, there are Christians who would love to hear the gospel, and the bishops aren't letting it happen. And so maybe if we have a council, more people will get to hear the true teaching of the word. You know, you know Luther's like, for our, for our part, 
we don't need to have a council. We, we already have the true teaching of, of the word. We, we are able to teach the catechism. We, we don't need the Pope to come and tell us that we're right. We, we already are. Uh, but we hope that a council might afford us opportunity and this pure preaching to other people as well. Uh, so his, his, his thinking has kind of shifted now. You know, we don't need this external validation. We have the true teaching of Scripture, and we hope to have an opportunity to share it with other people. Um, and that, that might sound arrogant. You know, we're in, we're in 2022, and if somebody says, oh, I know I'm right, you know, everyone kind of has to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think we should read Luther here as being, being genuine. You know, we have the pure teaching of the gospel, and this would be a great blessing to people if they only heard it. Um, you know, this could be, I mean, the example of people who, who come to Lutheranism from, uh, from Roman Catholicism or um, evangelicalism, where it has this strong emphasis on works. You know, to then hear that we go to heaven not because of our own striving, but because of what Christ has done for us. You know, that lifts a great spiritual load. And so Luther is saying we, we should have a council not so that the Pope can tell us that we're right or wrong because we know the answer, uh, but so that the spiritual burden of so many people might, might be lifted and they might be comforted by the gospel of Christ. So we should read this not as arrogant, but, but as a genuine care and concern for, uh, for churches, for Christians. And it says, paragraph 12, Besides, such necessary church, besides such necessary church affairs, many important matters in the political realm could also be improved. The princes and the estates disagree. Interest rates and greed have burst in like a flood and are defended under the law. Also disrespect, lust, extravagance in dress, gluttony, gambling, pomp, and all kinds of bad habits and evil. Subjects, servants, and workers in every trade are insubordinate. The demands on the peasants are unfair. Prices are exorbitant. Who can list everything? These things have increased so much that they cannot be corrected by ten councils and twenty commissions. The council would have their hands full if such important issues of the spiritual and earthly realms that are contrary to God would be considered. The childish absurdity of long official gowns, large tonsures, broad sashes, bishops or cardinals' hats, maces, and other vanities would be forgotten. If we had first followed God's command in ordering in the spiritual and secular realms, we could then find enough time to reform food, clothing, tonsures, and surplices. As long as we want to swallow camels and strain at gnats, and ignore the logs and judge the specks, we might be satisfied with the council. So Luther says, you know, besides settling the spiritual issues that are going on, maybe if we had a council together, we could fix the things that are going on in the political realm too. And some of these things don't sound too different from now, do they? You know, disrespect, lust, extravagance and dress, gluttony, gambling, pomp, uh, servants are insubordinate, you know, prices are unfair. Uh, interest rates, you know. Uh, Luther writes a lot about usury. You know what usury is? Charging in interest, you know. Uh, that Luther's position, and, and long, for a long time, the position of the church has always been Christians do not charge interest. And if you lend somebody money, uh, consider it a gift. Uh, you know, that don't charge these interest rates. But what's happening in Luther's time is Christians are starting to charge interest. They used to be only the Jews charged interest, uh, but then the Christians started to do it too, and, and at incredible rates, you know. Um, you know, things like uh, if we get a credit card now, you know, I pay, well, I mean, of course I have a credit card, pay off the balance every month, but if you carry a balance on your credit card, what kind of interest rate do you think you're going to get? 24, you know, one, you know, one quarter of, of 
the principal can be owed in, in interest, you know. Uh, for student loans, you know, thankfully all my student loans are paid off, but uh, you know, I, didn't, I never had any private loans. I had the wherewithal not to do that, but even the federal loans are like 5.9, 6%, you know. Um, you know, and these 18 year olds are taking on these loans at interest and having no idea what they're doing. Fortunately, I received good counseling and, you know, and, uh, in both high school and then in college and then in seminary to kind of have a handle on things. But uh, you enter like the private loan market and, you know, for schools and it's just ridiculous. And so Luther says, if we call this council together, you know, uh, not only can we talk about spiritual things, but also because there's going to be princes and woolly rulers present at this, Maybe we can take the opportunity to fix some things in the world, too. But then his optimism kind of dies for a second because then he says, well, actually, there are so many things wrong in the world. Maybe we should just focus on the spiritual issues. And then, and then if we get that right, then maybe everything else will fall into play. Right? Now he's talking about, uh, do you know what a tonsure is? That, that's the monk haircut, you know, where there's this, like, this band of, of hair, you know, and then they're, you know, shaved up here and, and back here. That, that's, that's a tonsure, you know. K kind of, uh, you know, uh, talks about uh, cardinals and bishops' hats. Like, uh, sometimes I love watching the Catholic, like, TV channels, especially, like, when they have things going on at St. Peter's, the Vatican City, and you see these bishops and the cardinals, and they all got their different uniforms and different pretty hats and things like that. And you can see the lace and like, uh, it's so much attention is devoted to pomp, you know, that might be better devoted to actual study of God's word, you know, or actual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so. Yeah. Okay, so now Luther's going to get to it. He says, 14. That is why I have presented just a few articles. We already have so many commands of God to observe in the church, the state, and the family that we can never fulfill them. So what good are decrees and statutes from a council, especially when the important matters commanded by God are ignored? As if he had to honor our vanities as a reward for our treading his solemn commandments underfoot. But our sins weigh upon us and cause God not to be gracious to us. But we do not repent and instead want to defend every abomination. O Lord Jesus Christ, may you yourself hold the counsel. Deliver your servants by your glorious return. The Pope and his followers are done for. They will have none of you. Help us who are poor and needy, who sigh to you and who pray to you earnestly according to the grace you have given us through your Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns with you and the Father blessed forever. Amen. Yeah, see, uh, does that sound terribly different from, like, say, the call to the day that we have you know, every Sunday? You know, that, that way of praying has been around for a long time, you know, well known to Luther as well. Um, so now we're going to get to the body of the small call articles. And these were written by Luther to be presented at a council, uh, which didn't, didn't happen. Or, or a council did happen, but not until right before Luther died. And the main purpose of that council was to condemn Luther. You know, that, that's kind of the point of it. Um, but the way that this is going to flow is it's divided into three parts. Uh, the first part is stuff that we have no beef over. There is, there is no argument over this first part. You know, neither us nor, nor the Pope have, have any disagreement over that first part. The second part uh, is where it gets spicy. And the second part is uh, issues where we do have a legitimate problem. Uh, and, and we teach what the scriptures say and they condemn us. You know, so there's going to be uh, a part of the mass, um, on, I think on monasteries, cloisters, things like that. Um, that's going to come up. That this will be the pretty spicy part. And then the third part are, you know, okay, things that we can talk about. Like if we have uh, somebody from the Pope 
who is of goodwill, who is interested in talking to me. Here, here are things that, that perhaps we can, can find a center point on. Yeah. So that's the division. First part, no problem. Second part, this is our major stuff. Third part is this is the stuff that, that we can talk more about. Um, and it gets shorter as it goes on because Luther is very sick and thinks he's going to die. And by the third part, he's having to dictate rather than write himself. And so that, that's going to shorten things a little bit. But the first part says, The awe-inspiring articles on the divine majesty. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons in one divine essence and nature, are one God who has created heaven and earth. Yeah. No, dis no disagreement. The Father is begotten of no one. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit, but the Son became man. The Son became man in this matter, manner. He was conceived without the cooperation of man by the Holy Spirit and was born of the pure Holy Virgin Mary. Afterward, he suffered, died, and was buried, descended to hell, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God, will come to judge the quick and the dead, and so on, as the apostles and Athanasian creeds and our children's catechism teach. Concerning these articles, there is no argument or dispute. Both sides confess them. Therefore, it is not necessary now to discuss them further. So, uh, you know, this is stuff we, we're not arguing about who God is. We're not arguing about the Trinity. We're not arguing that Jesus died and rose from the dead. You know, some of those things are things that Christians argue about now, sadly. Um, one interesting note is here concerning Mary. Uh, now, the, the position of the Synod, I think, officially uh, and, and I would say this is probably the, the best case to make biblically, is that uh, what's the important thing about the virgin birth? What is the important thing? That, that Christ was born of Mary while she was a virgin. That's the important thing. Uh, the scriptures at times in the Gospels refer to Jesus' brothers and sisters. You know, one of which being James, the author of James, and Jude being the author of Jude, uh, both of whom, Jude especially, reference themselves as brothers of Jesus, right? Uh, and uh, the position of Lutheranism has generally been that brother means brother, that uh, Mary and Joseph, after Jesus, had other children. Uh, but the position of the Roman Catholic Church and, and some in our church body uh, is that Mary was a semper virgo, meaning that Mary remained a virgin after having Jesus, um, and that Jesus' brothers mentioned in the Gospels are either cousins uh, or they are children of Joseph before he married Mary, that Joseph had a first wife, uh, that she died, and so they would, they would be stepbrothers, I guess, of, of Jesus. Um, and, you know, the Roman Catholics, they have their various reasons for, for believing that. Uh, but where it has entered our church body is from this phrase here, where it says, born of the pure, holy Virgin Mary. You know, uh, Luther wrote this in German, and that's what he wrote. Pure, holy Virgin Mary. That, we're fine with that. However... This got translated into Latin by a guy named Philip Sel or Selnecker, Nicholas Selnecker. And when he translated it into Latin, he translated pure holy virgin into semper virgo, always virgin Mary. And that was the version that ended up in, in our Book of Concord. Um, the version we're reading retains the German translation. Uh, and so that kind of entered, and there are some in our, in our church body who will say that, yes, Mary... Uh, remained a virgin after Jesus' birth. Is it a big deal? No. I, I tend to read the, 
the scriptures as it says brother, I'm fine with that. You know, what is important is that Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus. That is, you know, that is the important thing. Um, so, but that's where this comes from. If you, so if you run into a pastor and we, I wouldn't be shocked if we had a pastor who was here formerly before me who probably would say that, uh, that, that Mary was a, you know, not, you know, in the past, you know, that uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he believed that. And I know St. John that believed that. Maybe didn't talk about it from the pulpit, but I know he believed it. Um, whereas, you know, we'd say, well, the important thing is that Mary conceived Jesus while she was a virgin. That's the important thing. If we lose that, we kind of lose everything. Why is it important that Jesus was born of a virgin? I haven't asked that. Why is that important? <clears throat> Pure from what? The Holy what was Jesus born without? Sin. Sin right? Uh, in the biblical understanding, original sin is passed down through the Father. Uh, that all of us who have been born, we have fathers. That's, that's, how, that's, that's part of how it works. Uh, that, in the biblical reckoning, that is how sin is passed out. It's through the Father. Jesus does not have an earthly father. Therefore, no original sin. Right? That's why that's important. Um, the, the Roman Catholics... You know, the, the church in Fairbank is called Immaculate Conception, and that's not a reference to Jesus. Immaculate Conception is a reference to Mary, because they take it a step back and they say, well, in order to Jesus be born without sin, not only does he need to not have an earthly father, but Mary also needs to be without sin. Uh, in order for that to happen, she needed to be conceived immaculately by, uh, what, Joachim and Anna, you know, uh, Mary's parents. You know, and, and I don't know how far back before it stops, but that's what that is a reference to. You know, and that really didn't become an official Catholic doctrine until the 1850s, 1854, I think, uh, is when that became fully promulgated by the Pope. Um, you know, so that's that's why that is important. You know, uh, the, the the virgin birth of Jesus is important because it means Jesus was born without sin. And our response to uh, Mary needing to be without sin, we'd say, well, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in such a way that even though he received his flesh from Mary, it happened in such a way that it was without sin. That's why the Holy Spirit was there. So uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't fall into that trap of saying, well, Mary needed to be sinless too. Okay? We, we wouldn't do that. So anyway, long field trip. This first part, no disagreement. We believe in the triune God. Uh, that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Father begets the Son, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Son is the one who became flesh, who suffered and died and rose. Uh, no disagreement. You know, therefore, we very confidently say people in the Roman Catholic Church are Christians. You know, uh, you know that we've talked about this numerous times. We, we do not assert that if you're not a Lutheran, you're not going to heaven. We, we, that is not what we say at all. And, and if people accuse us of that, they're, they're either incorrect or they're making it up. You know, or they're angry at us for some reason. Second part now. Now we get to the spicy stuff. And this one is already going to be cool. It says, the articles that refer to the office and work of Jesus Christ that is our redemption. The first and chief article is this. Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins and was raised for our justification. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And God has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. All have sinned and are justified freely without their own works or merits by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, in his blood. This is necessary to believe. 
this cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, law, or merit. Therefore, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us. As St. Paul says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law, and that he might be just, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Nothing of this article can be yielded or surrendered, even though heaven and earth and everything else falls. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And with his stripes we are healed. Upon this article, everything that we teach and practice depends. In opposition to the Pope, the devil, and the whole world. Therefore, we must be certain and not doubt this doctrine. Otherwise, all is lost, and the Pope, the devil, and all adversaries win the victory and the right over us. Now, this one is pretty spicy. Why? What is Luther saying here? How, do we go to, how are we made right with God? How do we go to heaven? Is it by works? But by faith in Christ. Apart from works. That we are saved. We are declared righteous. That's what justified means. We are made right with God. Not by our works. But by Christ. And this justification. This reconciliation is received by his grace as a gift through faith without works totally yeah by faith right yeah and this is the article uh, that is called the the article upon which the church stands or falls that if you lose this, according to Luther, you place yourself outside of the Christian church, Luther would say. You know, he sometimes talks about there are two religions in the world. There's the religion of the gospel and the religion of the law. And the religion of the gospel is that we believe in Jesus Christ who suffered and died and rose for us, who forgives our sins by his grace through faith without our works. And the religion of the law is, is everything else, including in the Pope's church. And so Luther says, we cannot yield on this point, not in any way, because if we do, everything is, everything is lost. You know, that, that if we yield any part of our salvation to us, it, it's over. You know, that's what makes this so spicy, you know. Uh, and that's part of why, you know, um, you guys maybe wouldn't remember this. I don't because I was only 10 when it happened. But in 1999 or so, there was this big gathering uh, between the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation, um, of which we are not a part, but the ELCA is. And they got together and basically said, Lutherans and Catholics believe the same thing about justification, which is not true in the least bit. Not true at all. Um, but that didn't stop them from doing, putting together this document. And so as far as the ELCA and, other, and the other Lutheran churches and Lutheran World Federation are concerned, there is no difference on this dark article between Lutherans and Catholics. That we both believe we're saved by God's grace through faith apart from works. That's not what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. It isn't. And so Luther says, if we yield on this, it, it's all over. You know, it, it's done for. You know, we have we have jumped out of the ship. And so that's what makes this so spicy, because this is very offensive to the Pope. Very offensive. You know, especially this that, you know. Uh, this is necessary to believe. This cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, any law, or any merit. R righteousness before God is entirely a gift 
of grace through faith and not by works. You know, and, and we keep saying this because of how important this is. You know, that if we lose this, it's over. You know, we, we, we have left the scriptures. We, we have left the true teaching of God, you know, and have, have wandered off into our own. You know, that's what makes this so serious. Uh, and uh, the response of the Roman Catholic Church to this in the Council of Trent uh, is to say that if anyone believes that they are saved by God's grace through faith and, and without works, uh, let him be anathema. You know? uh, so their response to this was to say, if, if this is what you believe, you know, you're going to hell. That, that's, that's what the Catholic Church teaches. You can, you can Google the Council of Trent, you can, you can read this. Um, they, they talk a good talk, but they haven't taken that back. They haven't, you know, and so this, this is still a very, you know, uh, it's still a very painful thing. You know, we, we hope and pray to God for a day where there might be reconciliation, uh, but that reconciliation does not come at the cost of Scripture, you know, if that makes sense. That, that we hope and pray for, for reconciliation with all Christians, and certainly we will be in heaven, but we don't achieve reconciliation by leaving God's word behind. Uh, and although we might sometimes very much like to do that, you know, there, there's, there's this, there is a longing, I think, in every Christian, like, you know, when we have the Lord's Supper, you know, when we have visitors, you know, who, who aren't, we aren't in fellowship with, you know, and, and we have to say, you know, for now, let's not commune together. That's really not fun, you know, and, and none of us likes to do that. I don't like to do that as a pastor, and we long for, the time in heaven when we will get to commune together, or, or perhaps you know, uh, through reconciliation here on earth that, that we'll get that. But the way that we do that is not by setting aside God's word. The, the way we achieve fellowship is by uh, taking up God's word and having honest conversations with, what does this say? You know, what does this mean? You know? um, and so it's very, it's very, it can be very hard, but Luther makes this point of salvation is by grace through faith, apart from works, which is what the Bible says. And if you lose that, game over. You know. Why, why does the Lutheran church continue to exist? Because this is a big deal. You know. All right, I'm going to drink my coffee, then we'll go on to the mass. Doris, you look like you're thinking. Karen's not here, so now it's dangerous for you to think. <laughs> you know. I mean, if, if this wasn't a big deal, why would the Lutheran Church exist? Like, like if this wasn't a big deal, why, why, would be, why would we be doing this? Why would we be taking, you know, well, I mean, we all support this congregation, you know, and, and to have a pastor and, you know, and to have Sunday school and things like this. The, you know, we all have money and blood and sweat, you know, uh, in this. And, and why do this? if this is not a big deal? Why, why not just go to some other church that teaches differently on this topic? You know? No, it's because this, you know, the Holy Spirit has granted us to believe and to confess that this is true and that apart from this is bad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's falsehood. You know? Or else we wouldn't be here. You know? um, and I think this is going to become more and more apparent uh, as time goes on and as our country goes the way it does, um, I'm not terribly fearful for the Missouri Synod. Um, there are other church bodies in our country that are in very real danger of not existing, even in 10 years from now. Uh, I don't have that worry about the Missouri Synod. I think you know, congregations will, will close as we age and, and as you know, things shift in our country demographically. Uh, but we're not going anywhere, you know. And if anybody knows anything about the history of the Missouri Synod, has the Missouri Synod always been peaceful? Has it always been a peaceful history? No, it's often been terrible, you know. Uh, there's been fighting, in, in, you know, inside and outside. There's pressure from the world. And yet, 
here we are, you know, and it's, it's got to be a miracle of God. Otherwise, what happened in the 70s, if God had not been on our side, the Missouri Synod would have been gone. Kaput. And people tried. People really tried to destroy the Missouri Synod. Uh, and I don't mean to get on a high horse because that danger always looms. Uh, but if we, if we stick to God's word, we continue in prayer, uh, we receive his sacraments in thanksgiving and faith, you know, the kingdom of ours remain us. Right? And that's why Lutheranism is growing all over the world. And, and our kind of Lutheranism is spreading like a wildfire, you know, all over. Uh, because more and more people are, are realizing this from Scripture, are believing this. And in our country, I think it's going to become apparent as, as churches close, uh, as people walk away from the faith, you know, by God's grace we will endure uh, because we, we hold this as... You know, this is what is important to us. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and this is connected in this way. Uh, so Doris was talking about you know, some, some terrible decisions and viewpoints that other, other churches have. And the connection is that doctrine is not a series of interconnected points that you can pull one thing out here and it doesn't change anything anywhere else, right? Um, it, the teaching of Scripture is all, it's all connected. Right? And we'll see this in the next article on the Mass because Luther is going to talk about all of the terrible things that have come as a result of the Mass or of works righteousness, really. Is that, you know, um, speaking of marriage, for example, you know, the way that churches get to their, their sad view of marriage is by, you know, discounting God's Word. They, they change their view of, of what, what, what do we believe about Scripture. And because they changed that, that allowed ripple effects you know, over here, right? Because if you decide that, uh, you know, say St. Paul's letter to the Romans uh, in chapter 1 where he talks about homosexuality and things like that, um, if you decide that that portion of Scripture was Paul's writing and not the Holy Spirit, then you can say, well, that part does not apply because that was Paul's writing and not the writing of God. You know, you can, so you can see how then that opens the door for issues later, right? So it's all, it's all connected. And even back to this, right, uh, that your know, salvation is not by our works. This, this all has ripple effects elsewhere, you know. And uh, if we depart from God's word, we'll find that we won't last long, you know, and... And some of the churches that are going to disappear in America in the near future are ones that have made decisions like that, have made decisions to depart from God's word. And what's going to happen? Well, they're, they're going to reason themselves into non-existence. You know, that's, that's sad. And, and, and we pray that, um, well, for two things. One, to keep an eye on ourselves so that we don't become arrogant or complacent uh, with ourselves or prideful or any of these things. Uh, we, we want to be a beacon of truth, of mercy, and, and of love, right? And, and we pray that uh, some of the people in these churches uh, might, might come to us. They might say, you know, my, this church is not teaching Scripture. And, and this is happening in drips and, and trickles, you know, where people are saying, you know, I think it's time to wake up. You know, and, and time to be a Christian, you know, um, and but also we keep an eye on ourselves. Right? Now, this this interconnectedness this comes into play with the mass, right? And so this is Article Two. Okay, here we go. We're going to launch right into it. The mass in the papacy has to be the greatest and most 
horrible abomination since it is directly and powerfully conflicts with this chief article. Above and before all other popish idolatries, the Mass has been the chief and most false. For this sacrifice or work of the Mass is thought to free people from sins, both in this life and also in purgatory. It does so even when offered by a wicked scoundrel. Yet only the Lamb of God can and will do this, as said above. Nothing of this article is to be surrendered or conceded because the first article does not allow it. Right? So the opening saddle is the worst of all the terrible things the Pope does is the Mass. And the bad thing about it is because they think that by the Mass as a work, people can you know, acquire the forgiveness of sins. You know, which is different from saying you know, through the Lord's Supper we receive the forgiveness of sins, that Christ in the Supper gives us forgiveness. This is different. This is saying the Mass is a work that people do to forgive sins uh, or to you know, lessen the punishments in purgatory. And, and this is the chief and worst thing of it all. Uh, it says, if there were reasonable papists, we might speak moderately and, and in a friendly way, like this. First, why do they so rigidly uphold the Mass? It is just a purely human invention and has not been commanded by God. Every human invention we may safely discard. As Christ declares, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, by mass, we probably should clarify what we mean. Uh, we call it the divine service. You know, uh, we have a liturgy and we follow liturgy. In the divine service, we receive the Lord's Supper. That, that's part of it. Uh, but as a whole, we would call it the divine service. Uh, to put ourselves in a Catholic mindset, they would call that the Mass. They don't call it the Divine Service, they call it the Mass. And it includes the whole portion of the service, so the prayers and the readings and the, you know, the, the different ablutions, the washing of the fingers and you know, the wiping of, of the chalice and, the, and the, the elevation and all these things. And there are these steps that you have to follow, which includes then the, the distribution of the sacrament, kind of. You know. But this whole ball is called the Mass. And they would say, that is a work that when done properly and with the right intention does forgive sins and acquire merit. You know, uh, that the Mass is a work that is done by, by the priest and the people uh, to merit righteousness. You know? And so Luther says, that's what we're talking about. Like, that is the worst of the worst. Uh, and he says, if, if we want to have a friendly conversation, if there's somebody who's interested in talking about this, the first thing we can say is that you can do away with the Mass because God doesn't command it. He does command through the Lord's Supper that we should be receiving the Lord's Supper, but do we have to have the divine service? No. You know, could we... Could we have just the service of the sacrament where we, you know, pray the Lord's Prayer, you know, confess the Creed, you know, and receive the Lord's Supper, you know? Um, my shut-in visit, when I go on a shut-in visit, uh, we don't usually do the whole service. We'll do the confession and absolution. We'll have the call for the day and readings and a sermon, the Lord's Prayer, or uh, well, the Creed, but we won't do, like, the Kyrie or the Gloria in Excelsis because it's, you know, those are, you know, we, we don't do that, and... That's fine. You know? So Luther's first point is, like, we could do away with the Mass as a whole if we felt like it. You know? But the fact that, you, that the Pope insists on it, well, well that's a little too rigid. You know? It's not commanded by God. The Lord's Supper is, but the Mass as the form of worship, not so much. Second, it says, paragraph 3, the Mass is unnecessary and can be omitted 
without sin in danger. Oh, see, he's, he's turning the knife a little bit. He's saying, first of all, God doesn't command the mass, uh, so you can, it's a human invention, so you can get away with it. I don't know if this is entirely true, uh, but I think that the canon law is that uh, priests are obligated to say the Mass every day, uh, whether there's people there or not. Um, so if you have a, you know, a local parish priest, um, you know, it is likely at some point every day um, he's in the sanctuary offering Mass, whether there are people there or not. You know, so if you look at it like a Catholic Church bulletin, it might say mass intentions for this day and this day and this day. Uh, you know, and if people come, that that's fine. But sometimes there aren't people there, and the pe the priest still goes on with it anyway. You know, um, that that sort of business is is interesting. Um, yeah, they they have mass at every service. Uh, you know, which is we're, is not disagreeable to us. You know, we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. That's that's fine. Do we have to? No. Could we have the Lord's Supper on Wednesdays too? Sure. Could we have it on Monday? You know, we could do whatever we want. You know, but to insist on it, you know, as the Pope does, well, that's not entirely right. You know, and, and the Mass as an order of service is a human invention. You know, and so we can we can do away with it, and it's not sinful to not have a divine service, to use our language for it, right? You know, if you walk into a Missouri Synod church and they're singing matins instead of the divine service, you don't go, oh, what a bunch of sinners. No, you should go, oh, matins, I like matins. You know, things like that. Um, you know, or even, and this is something that, that strikes at my own heart, like when you uh, go to one of the Missouri Synod churches that, say, isn't following an order of worship at all, or at least not a written down one, you know, we should also be careful lest we say, oh, this is not a Christian church. You know, because they're not using the hymnal or something like that. You know, um, so that right in a way. You know, and instead of saying, "Well, God's word is present," you know, uh, the, the preaching is, is biblical and correct. You know, uh, we wouldn't, we shouldn't just discount a church because it worships differently than us, right? Uh, you know, or else, you know, you guys didn't come to the um, the missionary presentation, but. Uh, one of the things that they brought with them was we have a new Spanish language hymnal that's going to be going out to our, our Latin American partner churches. And the way their hymnal is arranged musically is to be played on guitar. I mean, they, they have some piano players in the different churches, but, but most of the music is done by, by guitar. Um, and so you can see that in the way that the music is notated, and even what key it's in, things like that. Um, and there are some you have to have the organ or else it's not true worship, you know, things like that. And yet the songs talk about the, the strings. Yeah, harp of ten strings, you know, yeah, things like that. Symbols, maybe we can get some symbols in here, that'd be fun. Uh, at the seminary, they've got timpanis, and that, that's fun, you know. Um, Pam, was that a question or was that an agreement that we should get some symbols? I was a percussionist. Yeah. You hear it, Pam's volunteering to play the symbols. You know, so Luther's, so Luther's saying, you know, the worst of the worst of, of our biggest beef, and, and this is maybe different than what you would expect, because we don't always talk about it this way, but the, the worst of the worst of our biggest beef with the Pope is the Mass, which, you know, properly understood that they, they believe the Mass is a work, and a work that can be done to acquire righteousness and merit in God's eyes. That's what they mean. And so that conflicts with, well, how are we made righteous? Not by our works, but by Christ's. And so insofar as the Mass is insisted upon as a work, this is the worst, because Masses are offered every day in Catholic churches all around the world, all of them insisting that this is a good work that merits righteousness. This is the way people are taught to believe. you know. And from this are going to flow many other terrible things, which we'll have to do next week. No, wait. I'll tell you, I, we're going to the Twin Cities 
I don't know if I'm gonna if I'm skipping Thursday or um, I'll I'll say on Sunday whether we have Bible study or not. Um, but well, we should pause here because we're we're over time. Uh, it's gonna get spicy. Uh, if you just look ahead, um, yeah, we're gonna be talking about purgatory here, uh, pilgrimages, uh, relics. You know, nowadays it's not a Catholic church unless it has a relic in the altar. You know, uh, you can maybe go to St. A's and ask to see the relic, but every Catholic church um, is supposed to have a relic. I think it has to be in the altar. A relic is a, uh, a piece of bone or uh, some thing, some earthly possession that's connected to, to a particular saint uh, that is then uh, preserved and, and to be used in, in Venice. Um, in the, the Luther, the handsome Luther movie, he goes to Rome, and there's a scene where he goes down and he looks at, at a skull um, that is supposed to be of John the Baptist, and then he never graze, you know, there and venerates the Baptist. It's, that's what it is. It's a bone fragment or some earthly possession that belonged and was used to by a person who had been canonized. Um, in the earliest days of the church, they didn't do things like this. Um, and in fact, I don't know if it was Constantine, um, whether it was an earthly ruler or whether it was a pope. Um, in the early church, I forget when it was, but there was actually a uh, what happened is people started digging up Christians and stealing their bones to be used as relics, and the Pope had to say, "Stop doing that!" <laughs> you know, stop it. You know, and uh, but we'll, we'll, so we'll talk about relics next week. Um, is and then we need to talk about the invocation of the saints because that's connected to this. Because when you go to the mass and they have the the, the long prayer where they mention all the different saints, you know. Who, who we join in prayer and offer ourselves up to God as an unbloody sacrifice, you know, um, you know, we have to talk about that too. So, anyway, we should pause here. This is a lot to think about. Uh, we'll probably have Bible study next week. I'll, I'll mention in the announcements on Sunday whether, whether we will or not. So, uh, but let's pause here and then we'll call it a day. So, so let us pray. Gracious Lord Jesus Christ, you are our great high priest, uh, that you brought not the blood of animals, of bulls or goats, into the holy places, but your own blood, which you offered up for us uh, on the cross. By your death, you paid for our sins. You uh, took away from us the, the guilt uh, of, of our sins. You uh, received into yourself all the wrath of God that had been stored up for us. We thank you that all of this reconciliation, this justification with God, we receive from you as a gift uh, by faith, and that you yourself also work this faith in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that you have given to us through the Word. We thank you for this gracious, great, and, and comforting promise uh, that through you our sins are forgiven. And we ask that by your same Holy Spirit you would hold us steadfast in this faith, uh, that although the world is filled with diverse and strange teachings, we would hold this as our chief and most important article. By your same Holy Spirit, grant us to be faithful witnesses, that as you called Peter, James, and John to be fishers of men by the preaching of your gospel, so we in our daily vocations would also be fishers of men, uh, that our words and our actions would demonstrate the love and the forgiveness that we have received from you. Let your blessing remain with us this day and in the days ahead that we might return here on Sunday to receive your gifts. In your name we pray. Amen.